Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. recently co-founder of Govance, a company focused on bringing the world's brands to Latin American clients. Please welcome the co-founder of Govance, Romero Velasco. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Romero. What's going on, boss? You're, you're Now, you're actually calling in from a different location other than the United States. Where are you calling in from right now? I am in Mexico right now, Guadalajara. Gabriel, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm in Guadalajara, Jalisco. It's a second base city in Mexico, and it's just a beautiful place to be. If y'all are ever down here, I'll have a great time. Yes, and so Romero, I'm real excited about this conversation because he is actually helping the Latino Americans, the Latin American uh, countries specifically with their e-commerce. So before we get into all that, Romero, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, tell us what you do. Tell us your company name. Totally. So uh, I'm Romero from Go Advance. Um, we, I don't know, I've been in the e-commerce space for longer than I care to admit. Uh, it kind of is, a, to me, it's, it's a weird thing to dedicate your life to, but you know, what? ultimately, it's really fun. So been in the e-commerce space for about eight years, um, worked at an agency for a long time, uh, helping other, you know, helping people sell a lot. And then it kind of felt weird, like, why am I not selling a lot? Like I'm helping everyone else. Um so we like eventually decided, hey, let's let's get let's look at Mexico and let's see like what the market looks like because I'm here and I'm, I'm look. There's a lot of trends that we'll get into in later, but um, we realized that uh, there's just a huge e-commerce market space in Mexico and we started going after it. And now I am selling, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> it's funny how uh, you learn uh, to get really good at something by working on it for other people, and you go like, all right, now it's time to do it for myself. You know, and I think this is an experience that is very universal for everyone. Um, but yeah, I, uh, engineer by by uh, school, not by trade, marketing by trade, you know. And um, yeah, just feels good to uh, to be doing something that I like. It's it's a weird combination of uh, problem solving and also creative thinking, right? I think we can all relate to everyone in the e-commerce spaces. Uh, and everyone in the ent- entrepreneurial space finds sort of like that balance for themselves, so. Yeah, a little bit about me. I do a little bit of everything. I like it. I like it. You know, one of the things that uh, you you seem to have a very unique experience because you're an engineer, but then you said you're marketing by trade, but you're also a co-founder, right? And then you you actually mentioned before we got on the show, you actually went to school in the UK before coming back to Mexico. Tell yeah, us a little bit about that was experience. Funny. So uh, the UK will always have a special place in my heart. Um, I haven't been back in about four or five years. Um, but you, I built a family there, you know, I built like my my friend group and like people that you live with for for years and so on. Um, but it was definitely a shocking experience. Even when I go back, it's a little bit of a shocking experience because I come to Mexico and it's almost like taking a step back technology wise. Um, so t- 2012, we were already ordering our toilet paper on Amazon. And then I get back to Mexico in like 2017 and it's like, do we trust like that it will get to your house? And I was like, oh, we're we're behind. Right. And this happens with everything. I went back to the UK about four or five years ago and they looked at me like I was a monster because I had cash. I was like, oh, I owe you some money. Like, obviously, I'm international transfers. I'm withdrawing money. Right. And I'm like, here you go. And they go, ew, what are you, <laughs> this is all contactless now. And I was like, oh, I'm behind. And now we're catching up. Now we're starting with a contact lesson in Mexico. But um, it really has led to sort of uh, the way I say it's like it expanded my panorama or expanded the, the vision that I sort of had for, for business and entrepreneurship, just being in different places, being exposed to all kinds of different ideas. I lived in Indonesia for two years and I noticed um, creative solutions to uh, um, traffic. You know what they do? They just do motorcycle taxis. You get a motorcycle, they come to you, you sit in the back, they give you a helmet and you zip through traffic. I come to Mexico, I'm completely stuck in traffic and I'm like, why is no one giving us a motorcycle to sit on the back of you know so being exposed to different cultures and different you know sort of parts of the world will always sort of expand that that view you have 
And the UK was just instrumental to me getting anything done, I would say, to where my life is currently. Yeah, that's, also, that's, I, I just, no, I think that's a that's great good. point. You know, one of the things I try to encourage folks is, is to travel because travel opens up your your vision and perspective to so many different things. I mean, that's exactly how Starbucks got created, right? A trip to Europe, right? And is recreated into a, a massive a massive organization. Now, one of the things you also talked about was Amazon. In fact, one of the things you've done is you've helped massive growth, right? With 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 over 50 different companies reach seven figures on the Amazon platform. Walk us through that. How do you help some folks? Oh, I love this. Oh, you're getting right into it. Yeah, we're just jumping into it. I, I like meat, it. Meat and potatoes. Um, look, Amazon has become a I, I like to call it a PvP market. Anyone that's in either trading or video games will know PvP is per player versus player. Um, and the what I mean by PvP market, it means the the pie isn't growing as fast as it used to be, which means every sale you get is a sale that your competitor isn't getting, right? Whereas where uh, when the when the market's expanding, we'll we'll be able to catch new consumers coming onto the platform, right? And it, it's a much easier sell because there's no brand loyalty because they're open to exploring and so on. So Amazon over the past couple of years has really shifted from this SEO focused, you know, make decent enough images on fiber that we no one really likes and just pump ads into it to no okay hold on let's be strategic let's look at your business model let's look at the communication let's look at the actual like from a marketing standpoint what story are we telling in the limited now it's nine but no one's going to click it so in the limited five six images that we're actually going to get across to the consumer how are we making our text actually readable because all of us have bought something on amazon without reading the bullet points. Because are you joking? You gave me a 500 word essay to read. And this is an impulse purchase that was $7 that I just needed. I'm not going to do this research, you know? So really taking this approach of treating it like a legitimate business outlet, a legitimate, um, uh, let's call it like another retail outlet, right? Um, rather than, oh, this is just where we kind of put our stuff up and let it sell is just, I think, where where a lot of sellers are faltering, um, where it's no longer, oh, well, I found something on Alibaba. Look, and that will work. That will work for a lot of people. You find the right niche, good for you. You you did your research beforehand, whatever, good. But for the most part, it really is now a, okay, there's people pouring d- entire days into single percentage points in conversion rate, right? Like this is a v- highly competitive market. So- when you ask me how we're doing things or how like I, I've, I've done this and in in, uh, how I've seen success, it, I, I really attribute it to thinking like a consumer. You sit down and you go, bro, I'm not reading this. How much of this SEO is important? Oh, we can actually cut this in. All right, cool. Let's make it look nice. Hey, your image, like, for example, very simple tip. Uh, you know, no additives. It's like, OK, that doesn't help me what does no additives do for me or for like my pet or for like, you know, whatever. And then you're like, oh, actually no additives leads to healthier uh, gut health. Okay, cool. Then let's say that. And then say, because it has no additives. And these little just constant changes that you're testing are helping you build up the macro image, which is what's your business model, right? Like, Okay, you know what? We're losing money on the first sale for every consumer. That's fine because we're building a recurrent returning customer base. Let's figure out the lifetime value of the client. All of these conversations aren't really being had when we're looking at Amazon because people are just like, ah, chuck ads on it, fix the SEO. So that's how I've seen really consistent results. And it's something that I'm very, very proud of in my uh, sort of Amazon career. You know, one of the things you mentioned was the, the lifetime average cost of a customer. I think that is not spoken about enough in the product in the development world and in the sales world right when you're trying to create a sales i've talked to about the sales funnel before folks right essentially how much if when you have a sales funnel right and you're trying to get somebody awareness of your product or awareness of, of something that you're trying to sell or service and you get them down to a loyal consumer how much did you spend on average to do that that's what that means right yeah Yes. And then you know what happens? What you'll see is like sellers be like, well, they're, they're already a consumer. Why would I advertise to them? Why would I advertise on my own keywords? Or, and it's like your, comp- your competition is willing to spend 150% the cost to steal that cost to consumer. You should be able to spend eight, 
right? Like, come on. Like, we fought so hard over this consumer. Let's just keep them in the loop. Let's let's give them a discount. Let's, like, reach out via email campaigns. Let's just make sure that we're not losing people because we want to make a couple extra percentage points in profit. Like, what are we doing, you know? And these are a lot of things that sellers refuse to look at. And it makes sense. I think a lot of Amazon seller, a lot of Amazon business is uh, bootstrapped. So you're used to thinking of every single penny as like incredibly valuable, but you get to a point where it's like, you know what? You have to zoom out and see that this penny that you're putting in is because you're getting eight pennies more. Like we have to be willing to have these conversations. So, right. Right. Now what, now yeah. let's, let's, let's kind of talk about, you kind of mentioned, you know, essentially you're, you're building a brand on Amazon, right? One, how do you do that? How do you build a brand on Amazon? What are some tips Okay, this is fantastic. Um, I'm going to divert a little bit. Perfect. I'm going to compare current U.S. Um, sort of practices to Mexican practices because these are completely different and Latin American practices because it will in, they will absolutely depend on where your uh, average consumer is in their shopping behavior, right? Like, um, well, I mentioned earlier, I was in the U.K. in 2012 already buying stuff on Amazon. I think we saw the incredible growth from about 2016 to about 2020, actually 2020, like pandemic was massive for Amazon, but we saw this just constant influx of new buyers. Okay, these markets exist with uh, in a space in which consumers already are willing to come into Amazon to search for solutions for problems. You know, like I have uh, my neighbor's dog poops on my lawn. I'll go to Amazon and go like dog poop remover and then see what I can find. In Mexico, in Latin America, we're not there yet because what I'm going to do is I'm going to Google it and then I'm going to go try to find it mm, in retail. Interesting. OK, nice. Right? It's like, what can I do for my neighbor's dog poop? And we like you look it up and they're like, oh, there's this product. All right, I'm going to try to find it online or I'm going to try to go look at it in retail. You're not going to Amazon for solutions. So these are very different uh, uh, markets in the U.S., uh, Look, you gotta you gotta make sure that you're sure the branding, the design has to be very strong because it's uh, it's sort of the mentality of uh, of retail. If you pick up my product, I'm already halfway there. Like if you're walking, then I I'm sure you've heard of uh, Liquid Death Water yep. Company. Oh, yeah, yeah. That they just they just said, hey man, if you pick up my can, I'm already winning. Um, that's a really strong sort of initial approach. But then also treat consumers like just shout at them. This is why this product helps you. And it's what I was saying earlier. Like, uh, I sell, I don't know, dog treats. Let's use the same example. You know, this dog treat is a single ingredient. How does that help my dog? I'm not entirely sure. Well, I've actually dedicated six uh, images to show you why this is better than, you know, healthier teeth, uh, shinier fur, like all these things. And you go, oh, those are the things I want. That is a solution that I'm being sold, right? When you combine that with really great design and then you just you you make sure that the SEO instead of stuffing it, you go, all right, what are the top keywords that are probably going to help me? Cool. I'm going to chuck them in and then make it readable because I'm already going to spend on ads. I'm already I'm already going to get the people in here. I need to have them convert, especially the Amazon algorithm has evolved to be like, listen, you convert, I'll get the people to you. Right. So when you start sort of playing around with this. Um, you start building a really strong brand that you can actually transition. I've worked with people that have used the Amazon success to uh, leverage retail deals, to leverage Shark Tank deals, to leverage because they can go in and go, hey, look at what we're doing on Amazon. We're already halfway there. Um, whereas in Mexico, it's completely different. And in, in Mexico and Latin America, it is, all right, we have to do all of this, but also we need to be indexing on Google. We also need to be reaching out to social media uh, influencers. We need to be communicating that it's not only, hey, you want this product, but you want this product and you can get it online. And right now it's a little bit tougher, but luckily the competition is so low that it's very easy to be getting those top spots. So our our uh, sort of, um, our gamble isn't, you know what, right now we're going to be uh, the biggest cash flow driver for your company, but it's, we're setting ourselves up to grow like the U.S. did over the past, you know, 10 years. We want to be the 18,000 review garlic crusher and go from there. Um, but yeah, 
it's a, it's it's a complete different beast. Now, what would you say? Because because you, you know you're mentioning there's two different targets now, right? We have the Mexican target or the Latin American target, right? And we have the American target, right? They're all Americans, but just remember that, folks. We're all Americans, right? But Latin American, American, okay. Yeah. Now, with that said, what are some of the challenges that you see? You know, kind of for a, a foreign brand either building into the United States or vice versa. Ooh, okay. I have a question for that. Would you, because there's two approaches. There is consumer behavior and what makes that difficult, or there's a literal logistical, logistical bureaucratic challenges. Um, do you want me to go one? Both, let's let's go either? with the consumer right first. Actually, right. No, let's go with the bureaucratic because I want I want to say let's just let's just rip the bandaid off because at the end of the day, this is the folks. This is this can probably be more valuable right now yeah. uh, to listen to that. So let's do that part. Totally. So here's what's going to happen for most brands trying to sell in Mexico. Um, I, I, I keep saying Mexico rather than Latin America because Mexico is right now our biggest focus. Uh, and Latin America is a little bit just it's going to be a little tougher. And I don't think any American sellers should be shooting straight for Brazil. Right. Like that's just a, there's a little bit more uh, cost involved. Um, here's what most brands are going to experience. Hey, the remote fulfillment program on Amazon is, is available. And they'll test it out and they go, ah, Mexico doesn't sell. It sold like four units, eh, whatever. What you're not seeing is the thousands of consumers coming into the platform and going, oh, it's delivered in a week. I don't want that. <laughs> oh, I have to pay uh, 150 pesos delivery plus taxes. Like I'm not interested. This isn't the price you gave me. And the other thing for people that are actually um, taking this into account and dropping their prices and being uh, competitive then they go into Seller Central and then they'll see uh, the fees that Amazon's taking for remote fulfillment. And you go, oh, that's also not worth it for us. Um, so that will be the generally like 90% of the time, the first step into Mexico. You see that and you go, okay, let's try to uh, send to FBA. Why? Like it makes sense. We can get a pallet ready, freight, freight forwarder, get it into Mexico City. What happens then is Amazon goes, absolutely here's your ship. Let, let's create the shipment. Can you just real quick, give me your tax ID. <laughs> and that's where a lot of sellers go. Oh, uh, I don't have. One. Um, and then that's where a lot of the, the project falls through. And I would like to preface this by saying for 90, 99% of sellers, uh, getting a tax ID is probably not worth it. Um, again, we're not in the point where the volume is there to where the headache, the $30,000 you're going to have to put into building a, a local business entity, finding the accountant to comply, finding the legal representative, the, all this, like getting documents apostilled and sending them, like it's it's realistically not worth it, which is why like we are doing what we're doing, which we can talk about later. But so a lot of projects just sort of die there where it's like, you know what? Uh, we looked at Mexico and this conversation that we're constantly having. It's look, we looked at Mexico wasn't really worth it of course it's not because the barriers to entry are huge and you don't even know how your product will perform right i talked to someone that went through everything and didn't get an accountant so he never never uh filed taxes oh, end of the year no. comes around yes oh. yes end of the oh. year comes around <laughs> he gets hit with a tax bill he goes i didn't even make this much money what can i do and i was like you kind of you go back in time <laughs> <laughs> you do things right, you know? So it's just, there's too many steps in the way, I think, for, for your average seller to even be considering it, which is a shame because, again, our business started because I'm in Mexico and I'm like, there's so many brands that I can't get exactly because of this, you know? Um, so th those are some of the logistical challenges you'll run into. Like, look, just an example, we set up a business entity and it took us, two months to get an appointment at the tax at the irs it's 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 sat in mexico two months because they wouldn't give us a date they're like ah we're full we're fully booked we had to pay someone to constantly refresh the page until it was uh available slot and then put us in and i was like hey uh the meeting's uh in 12 hours it's like oh my god i was just like got everything together and ran you know like I literally, I got an 11 a.m. Uh, 11 p.m. text going, "Hey, your meeting's tomorrow at, at 11 a.m." And I was, "Oh, oh, you just put all the documents together, together, and ran in, right?" So, it's not realistic to expect 
sellers to want to you know like it's it's a great opportunity it's honestly like mexico's going to in for the next 10 years is going to be incredible but it's it's not realistic to expect people to go through that and then you come in and then uh, we haven't talked branding yet but you come in and your branding's not working your consumers aren't there the traffic isn't showing cpc is 80 percent cheaper that's amazing but you're not converting and it's just so frustrating because the value is there and it's literally just it's like having a USB C and then just having like the only USB like traditional, like, you know, to plug in and you're like, Oh my, I need a dongle. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's, I think that that kind of analogy is a great example of how you build a brand too. Right. It's like, you just essentially, you basically were able to create an analogy that everybody relates to about a problem that everybody has but that's completely, completely different from the actual situation that we're talking about. But it's pretty synonymous as far as like the issue, right? Everybody yeah. knows that, dang, that damn dongle. Uh, another great example, because you kind of mentioned brand um, and kind of building that, is that AT&T commercial. I absolutely love that new AT&T commercial when they talk, when they're on the airplane and they're talking about all of the things individuals go through on getting an airplane and, and like, oh yeah, you have to spend extra money for this. And then you have to, you know, the extra cost for food, extra cost for water. And at and is like, you know, we don't do that here. And it's like, everybody has that same feeling. Again, two completely separate industries, right? But basically creating a story about a pain point that they're solving for you. You know, now yes. one of the things, Romero, you also mentioned was what, things that you guys currently do in Mexico. So we'll get back onto the brand piece here shortly, but things that you currently do in Mexico, right, to to really kind of grow because you were seeing so many of these issues with the Amazon fulfillment and all these other things. So what is it that you guys do? Oh, we, oh, okay. We basically looked at this and said, the barriers to entry are way too high. Ultimately, barriers to entry meet are, are good for businesses in general. It's fundamentally anti-competitive behavior sure but it also is opportunity it's like spaces where you this i can solve this and help people um and this is sort of our, our mentality is like what are we solving how are we helping people um we realized that we can do it all once you build out once you go through that giant hurdle of setting up you're kind of just set up so we figured we can help brands get in by us acting functionally as distributors, like distribution is not a new business model. Silk Road existed, you know, <laughs> and this is not a new uh, idea. But we said, look, ultimately, Mexico is an unproven market. Latin America is an unproven market. But you know what it is also? It's 666 million people, like spread across like 20 countries or whatever, 22 countries, I believe. Oh my God, I'm going to sound so ignorant. No, I <laughs> scratch that across a some amount of over 20 countries. Um, and it's okay. This, this is giant uh, sort of gold mine of, of value that we can provide because we're really coming at it from not even for our clients. We're looking at this from the perspective of how are we helping consumers improve the, co the consumer experience, right? Um, so there's this giant gold mine of value that we can be providing um, if we can just figure out the right keys. So we had to set up a whole logistical, like, logistical infrastructure to be bringing stuff in from the U.S. into Mexico. Uh, and then a whole logistical uh, logistics infrastructure to be delivering products, uh, taking into account that we have two marketplaces. So FBA isn't really feasible for us because we have uh, Mercado Libre as well, doing more volume than Amazon. Um, and then it was like, but yeah, okay, great. You did the importing, you did you did the labeling or the approvals. Like, so, oh, because we also handle approvals. Um, you know, like if it's a restricted product, what do we need to do? What do we need to do on our end to be able to sell it? Because um, a lot of the, like ultimately the onus is on us. Like if we're selling something that's like harming people, we are the importers, you know, like we we are getting in, we're, we're, we're responsible for this. So how are we making sure we're covering our, all our bases? And then you get it on platform and it's like, and now how are you selling it? <laughs> so we looked at this giant amount of work that needs to happen. And we said, we can streamline it. Like for, internally, we're good at processes. We can figure out how to scale it. And then just take the headache from clients. It's like, listen, uh, there's a gold mine. There's a huge barrier to entry. The risk reward is not worth it. 
If I lower the barrier to entry, the risk reward is now worth it. Now I can take that coin flip to see what the market's going to give to me because it's all, the odds are in my favor, right? And uh, we're functionally, like, the way I like to see it is we're not proving the market because, again, Latin America is an unproven market, but we're making the attempt worth it and worthwhile and interesting, you know? What are tactics that you use to lower the risk of entry? Okay, so a couple of things. We have to understand where the barrier to entry is, is, right? And it's not only capital investment in setting up a business entity and doing all of this stuff. It's also a huge time investment. There's a huge opportunity cost in all the in all the work that you're putting in to get into the country. And then there's, of course, inventory uh, opportunity costs or inventory risk. Where it's like, all right, now I have this. Now I'm getting across the border. This is something I've never done before. How do I make sure that it's safe? And even then, what do I do if it doesn't sell? So the three just add up to a little bit too much. We've cut the capital investment by, you know, 90% because it's no longer this like $30,000 to get in. It's like, hey, we have a simple setup fee to make sure that we're covering all of our bases and then we're good to go. Um, we're covering the compliance fee, the well, the compliance risk by making sure that we're uh, A, being compliant uh, across the board uh, sort of with the product, but B, with taxes, you're not, liably, uh, you're not liable for any taxes ever. So we're good on that front. And third, we've lowered sort of the, um, the inventory uh, risk by saying, hey, we can start out small, ship a couple cases down, we'll try it out. Why? Because we have the ability with the volume that we do to Send it to Texas, like a couple of cases will palletize it and get it in. And you're suddenly not putting three pallets to make the numbers work, you know? So across the board, the idea was like the risk cannot, well, no, the reward is there. How are we making that risk? I I, I traded for a living for a long time, if you, which I, I hate that I talk like this, but <laughs> how are we, how are we minimizing this risk, risk to make the trade worth it, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it makes sense. And I think that's exactly how entrepreneurs' minds really think because at the end of the day, we are trying to minimize our risk, right? We're, we're trying to yeah. scale, but we're trying to minimize risk. And we are using a lot of these different metrics to kind of identify like, hey, are we actually improving? Are we scaling? And what's the cost of this scale? And are we going to yeah. remain profitable? Because that, that's, the yeah. end of the, that's the end goal, right? Uh, is, is true profitability. It sometimes doesn't start that first year or two or three sometimes, right? Um, and sometimes you do have to pivot. So it's always good to kind of get out there and, and collaborate and, and connect with other folks. Now, one of the things we we're talking about earlier, too, was brand. Uh, and specifically, you know, I talked I just mentioned collaboration. Talk about like collaboration and partnership marketing. Talk about like building a brand. Talk about how does how does that work? Totally. You mean on the business side, right? Business Not side. like to consumers yep. on the business side. That's actually I would and I'm totally willing to be uh, open here. I would say that's probably one of my weakest points. Luckily, I'm partnered with uh, one of, a really good friend of mine that is infinitely smarter than me than this. He handles the parts because I'm like, man, I don't, I don't, you know, I understand branding to consumers. I don't understand branding to businesses or, or, or promoting to businesses. But what we're doing is really, look, we stepped into, into the space. We worked on this business for a long time, uh, sort of in stealth mode, like making sure that uh we had all our ducks in a row because i'm like if you if you mess up a shipment like on day one you're pretty much done right so we we did a lot of testing a lot of dry runs a lot of and when we were it was ready when it was time to come to market we started getting introduced to people and people were just aggressively trying to sell you things and it was so uncomfortable and i was like my my whole mantra of what i do is like i need to be okay with myself right so i was going into these calls and i was like there's no way you feel good about yourself like we just talked for half an hour and you just try to sell me your product or like aggressively came after my mailing list. And that's not interesting to me. So we've had dozens and dozens and dozens of introductions of um, to people where we're just like, hey, man, this is what we do. But right now we're trying to figure out where we fit in the space because we're uh, we're in the e-commerce space and the e-commerce space just has every single solution known to man. And it's this massive uh, uh, ecosystem. And it's just a very non-aggressive coming in and being like, hey, is there a way I can help you or your clients? Is there not a way? And that's totally fine. Like, 
first I want to see where I fit. First, I want to see who uh, who I feel like I can build a, a trusted partnership with, where it's like, all right, this guy's acting in, in my interest. I can act in his interest, you know, in, in a very uh, positive, open and honest way. Um, and that's just giving us great results, honestly, right now, where it's um, being direct. I mean, hey, man, like, I, I really appreciate this time. I don't think we're going to be able to move forward because, you know, deep down inside, I'm just like, I can't trust you. But then being like, hey, man, like, let's let's talk about your personal life for a bit because we have a good vibe and you know your wife and your trip and whatever is sick cool let me refer people to you because i trust you and if you can be like that with me i can trust my clients to work with you you know i have no problem giving you that seal of approval like that is my my voice um because i you we've built up a, a real partnership you know and that's where we're seeing really good results i think anytime it's like hey man uh, we do Russia and uh, we would like to do an email swap. I'm like, all right, talk to my partner. He's more clever, but uh, I'm not going to feel too comfortable with this, you know? And ultimately that's all we have. Like, that's all we have in this space is like, who am I, po who am I posting on LinkedIn? Right? Like, who am I, if I keep posting garbage, like sort of like just spam, no one's going to see me. Yeah, so. very true. Now let's let's pivot a little bit to what you do know, because one of the things you mentioned, you know, you are in the e-commerce space. Uh, one of the things you also highlighted that I want to pull out again um, when you're talking about branding on Amazon is you're not using video, right? You're using still images, right? You're, so so let's talk about how do you build a brand uh, on an e-commerce website that focuses like, you know, building a brand to consumers? Yes. Oh, my God. This is so hard because everyone you talk to, they go. How can we get our videos up? And it's like, look, well, they're up, but no one's looking at them. Like, I'm I'm here to buy something in 15 seconds. Do not show me your minute-long video on why this is a good product. So you're immediately a no from me, you know? Um, so, uh, look, video is an incredible tool. But video, in my experience, um, it's either kept for ads to get the click, like on the, on the search results page, or... Um, or man, leave it on TikTok, leave it on Instagram. Like it has to exist. It will give you some percentage points of conversion. Like absolutely. And Amazon will like your listing better and it'll give you a couple of like rank, but don't make it your focus because we're here for quick, concise storytelling about your brand. And if I'm scrolling on TikTok, I'll watch your, I'll watch your video. Absolutely. And like 80% of my life, is, uh, that's a lie, but I 80% <laughs> of my free time is, is on TikTok, you know? Um, put it on put it on tiktok put it on reels send me that that traffic to to amazon great but it's just a different language on this platform so make sure that the images are catchy absolutely but make sure that you're getting to the point straight away do not give me too much text do not give me i would rather have a really ugly before and after picture of your product of like of like the use of your product than a really well designed with a lot of text of like why it's good look Show me, oh my God, that's the result you got? Sick, let's get it. Respect your consumer's time, I think would be the, the way to put it. Respect your consumer's time. Respect that they're busy people that just want to in and out. They want the solution. And you're going to start seeing much better conversion rate. And honestly, everyone, I don't think, I don't think most businesses are doing the stuff in-house. I think like most successful businesses are doing it through an agency. And I would say, talk to your agency about this. Be like, hey man, you know what? I don't think that the story we're telling, like, or rather, is the story we're telling sufficient to get the, the clicks, to, to get the, the conversion rate? And that you're going to throw them for a loop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you're I must admit, folks, you know, I'm not sure if you guys use. I never watch the videos on Amazon, to, to your point. I never. never watch the videos. Now, now with that said, where, where do you see the e-commerce space? You know, where are those trends in the future? What do those future trends look like? U.S. or Latin America? Let's do both. Let's do both. I want to do both. Let's do the U.S. first and so, Latin America. The U.S., I think, is uh, went through an, uh, an incredible growth phase, started slowing down. Then we got hit with a pandemic and it just went even higher. Um, I think we are at a point um, where there's absolutely opportunity on Amazon. Like, But you have to be clever about it. Um, and I think that for the time being, we, we we have to start looking at Amazon as less of a get get rich quick scheme, but 
and, and more as a, a Walmart, right? It's like, all right, it's just easier to get on, but I have to do everything myself and I have to compete over the sales, you know, like manually and, and figure stuff out. Um, and I don't think that's going to change. I think as time goes on, these uh, these young markets get solidified and mature and become just a look, the volume is there. But you got to be clever about it. And you got to be smart about it. And you got to like be pushing for it. Um, so I think the trend in the U.S. is just going to be continue to scale. Sure. But uh, business wise, we're going to start seeing or we're going to keep seeing this trend of businesses slowly over time, realizing, wait, this is actually really important to pay attention to. Um, so you're going to have full in-house teams. Like I, I keep uh, running into this, which is like, uh, I don't know, I sell a million a month and I kind of hope like my, my one agency does everything. And it's like, you're selling a million a month. You should have an in-house team that is communicating with your agency right? Like you need to treat this as a legitimate part of your business because it is a legitimate revenue driver. <laughs> like you're trying to squeeze out the extra pennies when, and it's hurting you in the long term. So that's for the US. For Mexico and Latin America, it's the exact opposite. For Mexico and Latin America right now, it is close your eyes, throw it on and just let it scale. We are in 2017 Amazon US, 2016 Amazon US. Where it's, we're seeing, and, and you know, Latin America wise, uh, sort of like macroeconomic wise, we're seeing very positive trends that we want to ride. Mexico is set up to grow. Uh, I don't know if anyone that's listening is, is familiar with the exchange rate, but we're getting paid 17, 35 pesos to a dollar. It hasn't been that low in eight years. Um, the, the trends for growth in the country are just ridiculous. Um, Everything from proximity, like close uh, proximity, physical land border to the U.S., meaning we overtook China as the U.S.'s number one trading partner. Uh, remote jobs flooding dollars into the market. Um, like there's just so many things like interest rates. Like right now we we have an 11.25 uh, interest rate in Mexico and yet we're not slowing down. So it feels like Mexico is set up for a very, very strong uh, next five to 10 years. And uh, when we compare that, when we add to that, the strong digitization of consumers that are slowly flooding into the platform, right now it is a growing pie. It is not a PVP market. Right now it is, a, I need to be in, I need to be setting up. I don't expect, like we're gonna, like what we're seeing on average for clients, our Mexican sales are 11% of your uh, US sales, which you're like, all right, I'll take a free 11%. Sure, like why wouldn't I? But the question is, where is it going to be in five years? And why are you not acquiring those consumers right now? I'm very excited for Mexico. Yeah, no, I was actually down in Mexico City, uh, you know, a couple, maybe last year, I think it was. And oh, I got to tell you, man, I, I love that place. It was awesome. Uh, folks, don't sleep on Mexico and don't don't listen to what they're saying. What Mexico does send us is they send us people during Katrina. When Katrina hit, they send their troops. Uh, when we had the forest fires here in the state of Oregon and Phoenix and town, they sent firefighters. That's what they send. Right. So so don't believe the the rhetoric that goes on around there. Now, that's that's kind of what the e-commerce is going on. What about what I'm what, What's what's up with you? What's going on in your future? Where what do you plan to do in the next five years? I plan to keep working like crazy. Um, I think I have, look personally I have very ambitious goals for life. I've, I've, which I've kind of toned down. Um, as when when I started running this business, you know, I felt like hey, I'm going to work twelve hour days for like the next ten years, and yes, we're going to crush. And then I was like, actually, that's not conducive to being happy. I don't want to, you know, wake up one day and go, well, I overworked. Yikes. Um, but for the time being, I absolutely I'm liking the pace. And I think that's that's really important. Right now, my day, you know, starts at nine. Then at 530, I'm in the gym by 730. I'm out and I'm back to answering emails and working. And it's nice. You know, uh, my partner, she's like, when do I see you? And I'm like, I'm really sorry. Like, we need to schedule time. Like, there is a communication thing here that we need to happen. Um but for the time being, man, I'm loving this. I'm loving every single day having to figure out new things. Every single day is a different headache. Every single day, um, you know, no one's looking at like, hey, where were you? Why weren't you here? Like, so that's really nice. Um, 
immediate plans. I'm moving to Europe next year. Um, that should be good. Not because I don't like Mexico. I've just, I've been, my entire life I've moved around. I've lived in 10 countries uh, so far. And it's like, all right, I need to go out, reset, and then come back, you know? So that's going to be a good trip. Um, and scale, scale, because this business uh, has so many add-ons that we can, that we want to be running, you know? And it's just a matter of get this one running semi-autonomously then start building the next one start building the next one start building the next one because we do really have a five-year plan for every business that we want to tie into this business um to sort of improve the experience without charging anyone extra you know it's exciting now what part of europe you're moving to oh, portugal oh perfect you know what i'm gonna actually yeah. be out in greece oh really so maybe we'll connect i'm, I'm actually gonna be flying nice. out to london uh, then going to go to Greece for a week and then uh, probably out to Paris and then head home. So I'll be out there for like two weeks Oof. living the oh, very nice living the highlight. But yeah, you know, it's kind of funny you mentioned that exchange rate. So, folks, that's a good point. Uh, if you have Mexican pesos uh, sitting in your drawer, they're losing value. Uh, you should probably take them in because the the pesos actually coming up or as far as like the, the exchange around, rate yeah. price. Right. So so yeah. just think about that, you know, um, yeah, now the, the Mexican. Sorry, just to, to go into that. We, because we handle all of our accounting in pesos, our clients are making way more than we originally projected because we, we started this at 20 pesos a dollar. So we're like, hey, suddenly margins are 15% higher because of the peso strength. And it's like, all right, this feels really good. It feels really good to be yeah. sending out this cash. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Now, now for folks that want to get in contact with you, they want to learn more about, in fact, you, you know, you've been on other podcast shows. How can they kind of hear more about you? How can they, where's your website? How can they contact you? So I'm going to preface this by saying that we came up with a business name before we knew how to pronounce it. We just thought it looked nice because avance means uh, <laughs> progress or advancement in English, sorry, in Spanish. So we said uh, just avance, but we're like, that's really hard. Avance, like it's not. So we added a go to it and it's a go advance. Um, but it literally was just like, it looked nice. And we did like the branding and we're like, oh, that we're in love with it. So if anyone wants to find me, uh, you can go to go advance, which is dot com, And the contact us form, the schedule a call form, it all goes to me, which uh, is getting a little bit daunting right now uh it's just a little it's it's too much going on but no look ultimately uh after you work in an agency for years and years you realize you'd rather have no client than angry clients right and um we just we the reason i'm it's my calendar up there is because we really need to make sure that this makes sense for for everyone right like we really need to make sure that um that this project is going to be good for you it's going to be a good fit and it's going to actually you, you're not going to be upset with us. So we're, we're turning away a lot of people because it's like, hey, man, like this isn't going to work. And I'd rather not sell you something, you know. So and that's a call that I have to make myself. That's why I'm still on these. So if you ever want to reach out, email, uh, schedule a call, whatever, through the website, it's me personally. Perfect. In fact, folks, this is a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter because if you forgot all this information, this information will be on the newsletter. We'll go ahead and plug that in. In fact, if you're uh, so generous, Patreon is another location that you can actually go and support the podcast for as little as $5 a month. You can go ahead and just support the podcast. That's how we go ahead and keep this thing moving. That's how we get the branding out there. That's how we get the marketing. And that's how we make sure we go ahead and pay all these little fun little operational costs in the backgrounds. Ramiro, thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we head out? Um, No, Gabriel, honestly, just thank you for having me. Has, like, I had such a good time. I know I tend to talk quickly sometimes. So no, you did great. Patience. Yeah. But um, no, I, I had a fantastic time. I think you, you really hit on all the things I like talking about, which is uh, always dangerous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's perfect. Well, Ramelo Velasco, thank you so much again for coming on the show. Really do appreciate it. We'll, I'll, I'll definitely hit you up later this year. Maybe we'll uh, connect out in Europe. So 
folks, again, don't forget to follow me at the, uh, visit at the shades of E.com. You can also visit us on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, and Facebook at the shades of E. And you can also check out reels on our YouTube channel. So go ahead and check us uh, look up the shades of entrepreneurship on YouTube. And then thank you again, Merrill, for your time, everybody else. Have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.